on and on and on. Yep, yep. That's pretty good, Chuck. Okay, I see red, and I'm not talking about my hat, everybody. It is the 113th episode of a bunch of aging astronomy freaks. Four of us gathered on screen to kick around the cosmos again, once a week. Everything from the solar system to the galaxies to the whole damn universe, from classic solar system physics to cutting edge theories, discoveries. We call it the SBAU Astro Hour. And it's all for the south coast of Central California's longtime telescope and astrophysics club, the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. I'm your host, proud to be vice president of the club for April the 17th of Monday, 11 o'clock in the morning till the 23rd of April. This week, before I introduce the gang, uh, we're going to try to talk this hour about meteors falling in the Northeast and Canada, although they fall everywhere. Maybe they got their own meteor shower. I don't know. We found another moon out in the Kuiper belt orbiting uh, Maki Maki this time, another uh, dwarf planet like Pluto. Got the whole story on our sister planet, Venus, and it's not pretty. NASA's Lucy probes on its way to Jupiter's Trojan asteroids. Take a few years. We're going to take a tour of the Markarian chain of galaxies. I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> Citizens using their scopes looking for planet nine or finding brown dwarfs instead. And what's up with Proxima B? Hmm. It's not citizens with lights on the planet's uh, surface, plus four new stars, and maybe if we get around to it, Dragonfly 44 Galaxy out in the coma cluster of galaxies. Let's meet the gang. The man behind uh, running this show and giving us our talking points is longtime beloved president, five years of Jerry Wilson. How are you, Jerry? Good morning. Good. Good. How's uh, Pat Forge, your beloved wife and supporter? Good. Good. And your cats are okay if it doesn't scratch you? On the bottom of my screen left is our outrageously outreachable guy uh, for the outreach, and that's what he prefers, setting up his telescope over and over, Chuck McPartland. Good morning. Who's married not only to Pat McPartland, but to his cat that he's allergic to. <laughs> and we have Tim also. Tim has signed in. All right. Oh, is Tim on? All right. Well, we're going to have to get his ugly face on the screen with us when we don't have the uh, <laughs> spam collector Bruce. Bruce is not with us this week, but... We do have our former Westmont guy, uh, the beloved uh, Tom Whittemore. How yeah. are you, Tom? Morning. Fine. Thank you for combing your hair for us today. Yeah, do you like that? <laughs> Looks like an unbaked <laughs> loaf of uh, sourdough bread. You know? From a nice little hike at Stevens Park with Wally. And, <laughs> and he's married to Maureen. In fact, it said Maureen's uh, something or other on the screen before your face come on. So you're on her connection to us, I guess. This is her iPad, yeah. I got gotcha. you. Yep. Okay, 113, we're in our third year of getting together on screen every Monday morning because we love this stuff. I can't get enough of it, and I just can't learn enough, but I am under, I should get some sort of degree for going through this incredible course with you guys, but let's uh, have a little levity first. President Jerry likes to ship us silly science cartoons, and we got several, and I, uh, this one I haven't even seen, I don't think. My God, you're going to have to... Circle of life, you got to, yeah. Oh, a circle of AI life. Boy, is that in the news lately? Humanity. <laughs> That's what it says. Can you make it even bigger or will it leave the screen? It probably will. It'll, it'll go over the borders. Oh, yeah. Humanity researches AI, artificial intelligence. Uh, intelligence. Humanity perfects AI. You want to explain this uh, box by box, Mr. President? AI perfects itself. Oh, I see the man's gone. We're yeah. back to being slaves to humanity. We're back to the pyramids. Solar flare disables AI. And then humanity worships a sun god. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how it's going to play out? Possibly. The <laughs> I don't know how many of you watched last week's 60 Minutes thing about uh, the web telescope, but last night they had a thing on AI that two-thirds of the 60 Minutes on CBS was just scary as hell. I guess the big problem with AI is that student there's several AI programs like BARD and stuff that are on, available on the internet. And you give it a question and it can answer, if you're careful, it can answer them quite well. And students are now finding they can have this thing write their papers for them. And yeah. it's very hard to tell from uh, human writing. 
Well, the only thing I have to that seems to be a, a possible saving grace for humanity is that they're going to be competing with each other. You know, Microsoft's got their AI and Google wants its AI. And maybe if one decides to take over humanity, the other one won't let them do it. Because no, that have... whole take over humanity, I think, is a little overblown. But yeah, uh, I hope so. I hope you're right. But uh, here we go. What are we? Oh, we're looking into the past. What are you writing, Mr. Scribe? Oh, a book about hurricanes and tornadoes. But uh, right now it's just a draft. <laughs> okay. That's there right. is a level of corniness I will not stoop to. Tom <laughs> well, uh, Whittemore is going to add that to his lexicon right now. Yeah, well, right. In the old days, we'd look through the back end of a telescope. And nowadays you look through a screen on a, on a laptop. But the lady says, wow, it almost makes me feel as insignificant as an unpaid internship. Hint, hint. <laughs> there are a lot of that going on. I, was, I thought it was just the medical profession. They don't intern these people for free hours at a time, do they? And the Yeah, company. that was a thing, especially in tech uh, businesses. Really? Exploit people however you can. Are there any telescopes today you look in the back end of like that, or are they all side sure. view? Yeah. Mine's, Refract mine's any refractor is like that. Yeah, yeah. I have a couple okay. like that. The, the, eight only, inch was the biggest one like that is Yerkes Observatory's 40-inch telescope, mm -hmm. which is... Mm -hmm. a, what year do you suppose they connected them to computers, laptop screens and things? That been 20 years, 50 years? Well, it hasn't been 50 Easily years. 20. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What Galileo would have done if he had what we have today. All right, get us another Ah, oh, <laughs> My daughter sent me this, and I... Send it out to everybody. Can you figure out what the word words are? They're half letters and half numbers. And I got it pretty quickly, and so did okay. the president. What did you think it said, uh, Chuck? Oh, I just made up some kind of silly <laughs> intransi intransigence is the uh, affinity for avoiding change or something like yeah. that. <laughs> I thought it was words of some, you know, some Be, being dyslexic and a little bit. Uh, um, Blind uh, helps. Yeah, <laughs> squint. I had no idea the numbers, certain numbers, several of the numbers can be interpreted. Intelligence, seven becomes a T, three becomes an E, but it's reversed. <laughs> and the Looking number, at it way too close. Yeah. yeah. Intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. Stephen Hawking, 573PH3N. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's that's everybody. Now, where are we, what are we here? Bad news for exoplanets out in space. It turns out those diffraction spikes, they're real. <gasps> Never be able to land on those suckers. Sliced it right in half. <laughs> well, you get them in fours or sixes or eights. Oh, here we have the uh, pterodactyl weatherman in uh, prehistoric days doing mm -hmm. today's forecast. Little did Pateri, <laughs> that's Pterectodon or Pteranodon or Pterodactyl. Mm -hmm. Little did we know that he know that this would be her last weather report. We know what's about to happen. And I'm sure, she says, we're all going to enjoy tonight's big <laughs> meteor shower. Including one 65 million years ago that wiped them out. Circle of life again. Yep. All right. Levity gets us. Well, it's kind of fitting to end on that. <laughs> sure. Well, uh, we don't have the moon on here, but real quickly, uh, where does it stand? It's about to turn over, isn't it? It's new uh, on the yeah. 19th, so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We saw it two mornings ago, but we, we can't see it anymore. Yeah, it's too thin. Well, okay. How long does it last as total darkness or black and you can't see either side? One hour? Technically, oh, it's instantaneous. Oh, yeah. it is instantaneous. <laughs> okay. Meteorites in New Brunswick and Maine. I wrote the, my own items down here. Calais, Maine, are they, are they getting the meteor shower this week? But we're not. No, this this oh. is a this is a meteorite. Basically, this has nothing to do with a shower. Although, you know, yeah, it's happening about the same time. It may have nothing to do with a shower. So they're looking for a reward, a twenty five thousand dollar reward. They've offered to bring in a monster, a big one. Well, they saw a big one and they tracked it on radar and they have a good idea where it fell, and they want people to go collect the pieces. Okay. And the odds are, uh, thank God, it'll hit forests or ocean in this planet. Well, they've tracked it to where it hit, to a little area along the Maine and Canadian border. 
Okay. Was it a big one? Did it leave a streak? Yeah. A big and one. they had radar tracks and people saw it and it blew up in the upper atmosphere. And But okay. So it was like Tunguska? It wouldn't have been no. that big. Well, yeah, on a mini, mini scale. 1908, it really blew up. Okay. So they're looking for that and, and they got it narrowed down to what? Just Canada and Maine. Yeah, between the, along the borders. I think it's a one mile wide path and I yeah. don't see a length of it. Yeah. And I didn't look that's, up, that's up what the heard, distance. But what? That's what I heard too. Yeah. It's like a big mile, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. But it didn't hit anybody's house or anything. Yeah. Not that we know about. Uh, they get melted down to look like the one that Chuck passes around at our star parties. I assume you're still taking it out there, aren't you? Sure, yeah. Okay. And that's about a five-pounder pound, five that ho you hold in your that's, one? That's about five pounds. And it's not like it got melted down. I mean, it that's the way it was when it came into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. But back in pre or back a long time ago, they carved them into things, didn't they? Ancient civilizations? Managed to well, it was steel, yeah, and they they used them as tools when they yeah, could. If um, if I remember correctly, I think uh, King Tut had a dagger made of yeah, he, yeah. I think he had a couple, and and they okay. took a long time to make. Yeah. <laughs> when you're using mm -hmm. rocks for your other tools, so, was, so they got. So steel. The, the impressive thing about this is that apparently um, meteorites are quite valuable. There's a lot of um, scrambling to be the first there to get something. And I remember there was one that was seen um, and it before before it hit the earth and it hit up in northern Africa somewhere. And a pilot apparently saw way off on the horizon, he saw a big flash of light. And then people went racing to where that was to try and find pieces of it. So, it was it was in the Sudan, I think. And that was yeah. Uh, yeah. And so this one, um, Unless it's made out of gold, I find it hard to believe that they're worth their weight in gold. What <laughs> kind of meteorite would be worth their weight in gold? It depends. It depends. Some of the really rare ones, like lunar meteorites, huh. um, they're hard to tell apart from uh, from Earth lithosphere. So they're actually worth quite a bit. And some um, palisites, the ones that are the mixture of the nickel iron and the and the gem quality minerals, are pretty expensive. I'm imagining any large meteor that would strike the desert would probably turn everything into glass around the impact site, wouldn't it? Well, the pieces that rained down on the desert weren't moving with cosmic velocity. The thing blew up in the upper atmosphere and they just dropped like parachutists with bad parachutes. Yeah, as this one did. Yeah. Blew up several miles up, it says, several miles above ground. Okay, so they would announce. They're going to announce if somebody gets that reward, and then we'll get to see whatever. I'm they sure do. we'll see. We'll hear something about that. Okay, so it's a museum. It's not NASA that's offering the award. This uh, this article appeared, I think, in the New York Times. Oh, and, um, they. Uh, it's a museum, the uh, Maine Mineral and Gem Museum, that's offering the reward in <laughs> Bethel, Maine. So the thing came in on April 10, which was. Seven days ago. ago. Oh, yeah, last Monday. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And and what makes things more valuable meteorite-wise is if they're called hammers, if they hit something, you know, like a fire hydrant or <laughs> uh, or a car, and if they're witness falls. So this would be a witness fall, which makes it worth a little more because okay. you can go back and read about it and things like that. Okay. There have been a few incidents in history where a meteor went right to a roof of a woman's home, I think, right? But not mm -hmm. many. It's very yeah, that was in Alabama, I think, in 1946 or 47. Came dead. through the roof of her house, bounced off the floor, hit her and bruised her. Right out loud. Well, all right. Fascinating stuff. Now, where are we? Um, meteor, uh, let's see. Lucy? No. the the trojan targets oh lucy's going out to uh, jupiter's orbit it's going to take several years just to visit yep. some trojan asteroids what are trojan asteroids tell our vast audience mr president or mr outreach go ahead jerry they are orbits they are asteroids that are kept in the um the lagrange points around jupiter's orbit um one of them on one side is called the trojan asteroids 
they haven't been studied much up close. And so Lucy is going to make a tour of that clump of things. And these are the first four. That There's many more that she's going to look at. But I'm going to try and pronounce these. Eurobatus, Polymele, Luke, Leucus, um, Orus. And, and there have been uh, occultation campaigns on each of these to try to refine their orbits. Okay. And some of, them, some of them are in the leading... The tro Trojans was sort of a general term, but then uh, around Jupiter, there's two batches, one leading at 60 degrees in its orbit and one following 60 degrees in its orbit. And so they named them on one side after Trojan um, heroes from uh, the Iliad. Uh, Iliad. Hmm. And then on the other side, they named them after the Greek heroes from the Iliad. So they have the Greek camp and the Trojan camp <laughs> but in each camp, there happens to be one that before they decided on that protocol was named for the opposite camp. And so those are called the spies. Huh. If you were to look at Jupiter's orbit from above uh, and use the clock and put Jupiter at noon, would these Trojans be at 10 and 2? Something like that, that yeah. About yeah. that 120 degrees apart. Well, is there any kind of a pie involved with... L2s and L1s, PI. Pi what, do mean, what do you mean by pi? Well, uh, are, our, are the Trojan around the Earth the same 10 and 2? Is that where the web is? The web telescope? No, no. That, that Well, those are Lagrange points, but they're not the Lagrange. There are multiple Lagrange points, and some of them are these Trojan like orbits, and the others are those ones like the uh, web is in that are on a line between the Sun and the Earth. Okay. Difficult to define what Lagrange means. It just sort of locks in place. And well, he was a mathematician, and though he figured out where the there are these points where the gravitational forces would kind of cancel out and make it a stable orbit, right. or at least the different, the different you, components you two, equal each other. Yeah, you need two bodies. You need two bodies, and so you got Jupiter and the Sun here. Okay, and two Lagrange points are 120 degrees apart. There's five associated five Lagrange points associated with uh, two things orbiting one another. Sorry, actually, Jupiter just orbits the sun. I mean. <laughs> yeah. and, and there's no uh, mathematical formulas involving pi? And, oh, yeah, and no, it's, it's a hairy problem. We solved it in astrophysics at Westmont one semester. It's yeah. pretty hairy. And Ron, you can find pi in just about everything. It's one of those transcendental functions that pops up everywhere, especially right. if you're dealing with any kind of circular motion like orbits are, or semicircular, you know, right. partially circular. Yeah, famous well, three point. I was going to say, Ron, famous calculations uh, that involved uh, finding pi involve integrals, you know, developing integrals that basically spit out what pi is. But okay. it's involved in uh, geometry with uh, circumference yes. of a two-dimensional two uh, circle. And right. the, what is it? The volume of a sphere uh, is pi r yeah, squared. Anything, anything that has to do with it, circles that really shows up or triangles. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's the volume is four-thirds pi r cubed. Huh? Okay. The volume it shows up so many places Yeah. In quantum mechanics <clears throat> yes. that or Planck has a constant that, that's described as little h, and h over 2 pi is h bar. It's so common it has its own symbol. Yeah. So irrational number, is that the word? Yes, yep. it's irrational. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, it's got, how long is it going to take to oh. intercept those uh, asteroids? Several years for Lucy, yes. right? Lucy's going to come and go, you know, because it has to come back into the inner solar system and loop around and head back out to go from one Lagrange point to the other. Okay, yeah. so it's overall, Excuse it's me like a second. A, I'll be right back. more than a decade long okay. mission, at least 12 years, I think. Meanwhile, yeah. in the middle of all that is the Juno still going around the big planet. Yeah, the big gas giant. Yeah. And trying to yeah. avoid its uh, incredible uh, magnetic field coming in every what 50 days or so swoops by and yeah, that's so, that's a protector for the radiation. I got yeah. you. So Ron. If you guys would let me, I have maybe a couple of little stories about this beautiful chain of galaxies up in Virgo. Uh, it's called Markarian's chain. It was named after an astronomer, Markarian. And I'll never forget the first time I saw it. I just finished an eight inch telescope, F5, pretty wide field of view. 
And you could get almost the whole collection of these darn galaxies. Some of them are a little bit too dim for an eight inch, okay? But the little smiley face on the right is definitely in, in the package. It's really, really pretty. So I'll never forget that. I, I saw it with my club, the San Jose Club, up uh, in the Santa Cruz Mountains above uh, the Bay Area. Um, and, you know, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Mark Wagner, uh, you know, taught me this collection of galaxies. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that when people see this in a telescope, okay, uh, they should remember that some this information has come about 65 million years in the past, kind of when the dinosaurs got hit. So that's one thing to think about. That's the other thing I was going to mention is we, we went to the Griffiths Observatory several times with the club. And when they finished the downstairs underneath the ground, there is an absolutely spectacular uh, image of this collection of galaxies up in Virgo. It's really pretty. It, it's just, it's just an, you know, an image from a very nice telescope. It covers okay. the entire wall down there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's really impressive. And I, this is just an old favorite of mine. You know, because I, I learned this when I was with my old San Jose club. And that space on the right, there's two two uh, sideways galaxies, and the one on the bottom is uh, at an angle of, away from us that look like some yeah. else. Yeah, yeah, Ron. Another thing to keep in mind is that, you know, M84, 88, 87, they are bright enough for Messier to have seen these darn things in the late 1700s. I, I think it was the late 1700s. Yeah. And um, they're bright enough. They're bright enough, Ron. And, you know, I always like the little smiley face on the right. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them are ellipticals, you know. Uh, the, yes. The, yeah. ones, the eyes and, and the one down in the lower left, those are ellipticals. Yeah. And but I think 87. got the edge on spiral to make the mouth. Yeah. And Is the 87, 87 the guy on the left, lower left? Yeah. The one that throws a jet. You can see the jet in a 20 inch. I've never seen it on my 18. A but jet. there's a lady. What's that? A jet you comes out that, of the center. Yeah. Uh, this that's the one where they image the uh, large central black hole, the supermassive right. black hole. That's right. And it has a relativistic jet coming out of it on each side, but you can you see on one side of the galaxy, yeah. you can that's spot it, it yeah. on a large scope. Now, it's amazing this, radio source. So I you, think this is M eighty six, is that right? Uh eighty seven was the one they 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 found the black hole in the middle. Right. Yeah, I, I know, know. But yeah, M80, is M eighty six. This is M eighty six. That is probably right, Jerry. I think okay. fourth in the upper left. This this picture was taken by a Facebook friend of mine, Hap Griffin, who does good, very good imagery. And he oh, points out nice. that M86 is interesting and in that it has the largest blue spectrum shift of any Messier object. Wow. So this one is coming toward us from okay. the other side of the cluster. Okay. 150 miles a second or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and M87 down here, which you were just talking about with the black <laughs> hole in it, is a gargantuan galaxy over 10 times the size of our Milky Way. Yeah. Wow. Are they it's all the 500 pound gorilla in the Virgo cluster? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, are these, they all close they enough to spill to... over into Coma Berenices, too, this, this collection of galaxy. Is this um, similar to our local group? It's bigger. Uh, it's bigger. bigger than the local group of our own little... This is, this is part of the super cluster, so this is much right. bigger. Yeah. Right. That's, yeah, it's the Virgo cluster. Yep. The left eye has a little sideways blob above it. Is that also... A, yeah, right there. Eyebrow. Is He's a... winking at it, Ron. He's winking at it. <laughs> I swear. Look at these. Isn't that neat? Jerry, that's impressive. Who took this? Your friend? Down here. Hap Griffin. Facebook friend. Okay, yeah, yeah, Actually, I can see. I had lunch at one time at a conference together, but he won't remember. I'm sure. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's a really nice image. It is. It's excellent. Yeah. And quite a few of those little blobs in there. I mean, that's that. A lot of that is galaxies, not necessarily stars. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. But that's not part of the deep field. No. Oh no. No. These these are close. In, in in a sense, these are close by, Ron. You know, sixty five million. Uh, Hubble did a deep field, took a couple weeks, and I guess uh, Webb mm -hmm. did one that took a few nights. Are they the same little pinpoint spot in space? They 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 tried to overlap some of them just to see how much more they could see with the James Webb. Yeah, so several oh. several of the deep fields they've taken are that way. Okay, yeah. the Hubble deep field uh, Ron was up in uh, the Ursa Major region. Yeah, and then there was an ultra deep field that was done yeah. in, in Fornax, I think, and that's one where they took the James Webb also. 
Okay. Well, I mentioned earlier before we went on the air, and I don't know if you want to talk about it or not, but apparently uh, the web did take pictures, did it not, of 13 billion mile away, uh, five or six, I guess six big galaxies. There's a size well, bus. Not 13 million miles away, but 13 billion <laughs> years in the past. That's, yeah. I thought I said billion, I'm sorry. But that's just a few hundred thousand years after the purported Big Bang, supposedly. And the, yeah. and, and the big question is, how could big. such large and organized galaxies form that quickly? But they yeah. haven't got really good spectra on a lot of them, so it's it's still kind of speculation. Assuming they're at that distance, then they're wondering how they got so big so quickly. And there's yeah. one of them that's imaged uh, with lensing from a for, from foreground galaxies. That's a very looks to be a very very large. Uh, very very massive galaxy that they that you know kind of defies current explanations of how fast such things could have formed but it again it's it's a lot of it is is still kind of iffy well apparently they've reached almost the limit of uh, x of uh, intra uh, let's see uh, infrared right it's going to go into the radio waves soon part of the electromagnetic spectrum. oh the red shifting yeah, the red shifting, they're not going to be able to see an optical version at all. It'll have to be radio telescopes that see the really distant galaxies. Am I making any sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, we can't even see those. Those, this those galaxies, as Chuck points out, might not be galaxies. They might be uh, some exotic object or even gigando black holes. Yeah, it could so, be the accretion disk on a black hole that's producing yeah. this brightness that they're attributing to. A, a single star in this. So there's day. a lot of information we need to pin down whether it's really a. Is that, <laughs> is that, what, the is that what's defined as as quasars? It's sort of. No. no. Um, the quasar is the jet that happens to point yeah. at you, but the accretion disk can also give off a lot of noise. Well, I can remember growing up and hearing the brightest thing in the universe is a quasar, and it's got to be something in a, in a galaxy, and it turns out to be just a huge black hole with a large accretion disk, I guess. Yeah, but it's the jet that's pointed at you that gives you that uh, apparent huge brightness. Really? Oh, okay. The jet. So like this jet coming out of M87 in the, in the lower left down there. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure if, if you're seeing signs of the jet there. There's... I think it's yeah, just it could be stars. little stars. Yeah, I think those are just <laughs> stars. But mm -hmm. if that jet were pointed right at us, then that would have been a quasar, wow. you know, or, or a blazar. You know, there oh. there are different names for depending on the angle that the uh, the jet is pointed towards you, how much it's pointed towards you. Yeah, well, if we get to it later in Jerry's talking points, there's supposedly four new stars they're uh, they're postulating or new discoveries or a theory, a theory, right? Four totally different new types of stars. What is this we're looking at? This is Maki Maki. Oh. And, it, and it's moon. And that's not that's not a new discovery. That was found in 2015. By a regular uh, optical telescope? Yeah. Yeah. This is, yeah, you can see the spikes from the way the secondary is supported in it. Okay. So this is, this is the, the planet, a dwarf planet that doesn't get any, any respect. We all yeah, it up. respect. Pluto gets the, uh, you know, became one of our official this, planets for many this years. This used to be the only um, dwarf planet out there that didn't have any moons. And so now it's joined the group of elites that have moons. And you know, Pluto has five. They all have some moon uh, or moons. And it's spelled like the word make twice. Make, so it's make yeah. Maki it's Hawaiian. Maki? Okay, yeah. Hawaiian. Do they name the moon or give it a uh, telephone number? I don't think so. It, has it, a doesn't, have, it doesn't have a uh, pronounceable name yet. It's kind of an, it's a, got a number, you know, 2015 in there to give you the date it was found. But didn't New Horizon discover a second or third moon around Pluto besides Charon or Charon? No, there, no, those five moons were found before New Horizons went there, but they targeted New Horizons to take images of some of them. Mm -hmm. So this sucker right now on the screen could have several more beyond that one we see then, couldn't it? Maybe. Could be. Moons could be very, very common. So it's called MK2 for short. Okay. 
Maki Maki. And Maki Maki is the second brightest frozen minor planet. And and this one's funny. This um, when Mike Brown found um, um, two thousand and three UB three one three and wanted to you know call it a planet. He he proposed the name for it of um, Xena because he liked Xena the Warrior Princess, right? <laughs> and there was no way that the IAU was going to name it that, but they ended up getting in some jokes, you know. But for this one, he found this afterwards. And he knew they weren't going to take his suggestion. He found Maki Maki on Easter Sunday. And so he wanted to call it the Easter Bunny. <laughs> but the IAU still got in a joke. They named it Maki Maki, which is the creation god of the Rapa Nui culture, which lives on Easter Island. Mm. Oh, you're kidding me. Easter Island? That's yeah. grim. <clears throat> okay, Maki Maki. <laughs> the world, and they leave that language behind the written language on those big stone heads no but i uh, oh. i think the spanish um documented some of their at least spoken language well, i don't know if they hawaiian. had writing they may have sounds like a hawaiian umuamua type name to me a well of a repeat. lot of those polynesian languages are linked oh okay I mean, they all have variations of Maui, their their god, and those are some of the islands in you know yeah. one of the islands in Hawaii is Maui, and, and some of them have links linguistically to Chumash Indians, to the, the name of their boat. But you uh, mentioned okay. Charon was, or when you when a minor planet like this, you find the moon on it or near it, then you can now calculate the mass of the object. Oh, that's, that's the big news of finding a moon. It's not just to add to the list. Yeah. So there's accurate information about the mass of Maki Maki now. That's well, why people really study binary stars, too, because mm -hmm. you can get the masses. Well, they uh, little dwarf planets like this do the wobble like binaries that are unbalanced. One star is smaller than the other. And there's a what do you call it? The center of gravity or something? Yeah. And so this sucker's going around and around. You suppose the guy that discovered Pluto a hundred years ago could have discovered this one, Maki Maki, just as easily. Clyde, Clyde Tombo did not have the telescope to discover right. this, but he did discover Pluto. Pluto's closer in the Much closer. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Where are we now, Jerry? This this particular um, fuzzy picture is represents two galaxy clusters that collided to create the bullet cluster. Um, normal matter is shown in pink, and the rest of the matter is illustrated in blue, revealing the dark matter dominates this enormous cluster. So and this is the picture that is supplied with one of four speculative um, possibilities for uh, stars, and that is a dark matter star. There's a lot of things. Um, anyway, if dark matter is our dark matter is made of neutralinos, which is a candidate topic for dark matter, and there's no evidence yet to support that neutralinos are there. Um, it's a type of hypothetical particle that may make up dark matter. Another one is like wimps. Yeah. These things uh, weakly interacting massive particles. It's an acronym. Right. Just just so, to jump in here and, and interrupt you, uh, one of the planetarium shows that runs on the weekend at the Museum of Natural History uh, at 3 p.m. is uh, Phantom of the Universe, A Search for Dark Matter. And they give a an illustration of this bullet cluster. This is where two smaller clusters of galaxies collided with each other and passed <clears throat> through. And the red is is the normal matter, a normal right. baryonic matter. And it's represented here, really, I think it's hot gas giving off x-rays. And um, that interacted, and, and you can see how it got displaced from the center of the clusters. But the dark matter didn't. The dark matter just passed right through. So that's this cold dark matter, collisionless dark matter, particles that don't interact with each other except gravitationally. Right. Well, we, had, we had to add the blue. I'm sure we didn't see dark matter. So these are all false color images. Yeah. Wow. Virtually everything you see in astronomy that's an image <laughs> is a false color image. I'm not sure how many of us are experts on dark matter. We all have our strange Nobody doubts. is, so don't feel out that you're well, excluded. 
<laughs> my, under, my understanding is they think it does not interact with regular matter, and yet it centers itself around galaxies and adds weight or adds, you know, matter and gravity. Anyway, the, the interesting thing about neutralinos is that they are their own antimatter particle. You're so kidding. They're two neutral, when two neutralinos touch each other, they uh, viol, uh, annihilate each other with a tremendous burst of energy, and thereby they can make a star and release this stuff. They're most likely, if they exist, and this is just pure speculation, then they would be big fluffy things that would glow um, for a very long time. Now they're different from neutrinos? Yes. Yeah, yes. neutrinos are a hypothetical particle that turns out they exist. They were discovered. <laughs> it was pretty, <laughs> it was a debate back in the 1930s when in order to get a theory to work out, one physicist, I forget his name now, said, I'm going to, a Dirac, and I think he's, he said, we're going to postulate the existence of this new particle, a neutrino. <laughs> But yeah. the neutrinos' properties are such that you can't detect it. And so they said, some competitor said, that's pretty convenient, Paul. So, <laughs> you know, he had to create, but that, then they found a way they could detect them. But they're very, very, very hard to detect. Huh. Is that why they have those sunken pools down inside salt caverns trying to... Yes, with all those, uh, with carbon tetrachloride and all that stuff. They've discovered how to do that now with ultra-pure water. So they're getting away from all these toxic detectors. Another possible hypothetical star is a boson star. Oh, so, is that what we're talking about? Oh, here we go. Boson, oh, so that's the dark matter star. I see what we're on, brand new stars that exist. All right, what's boson mean? Boson, it has nothing to do with the clown. This is <laughs> an image representing the discovery at CERN of the Higgs boson. Oh, uh, A boson is a particle with integral spin, uh, zero, one, two. Um, for example, Fermi particles that, that we're more familiar with, like electrons, protons, neutrons, they have integral half spin. So, um, um, and, but a boson, and, and they... They're called Fermi particles because they obey the Fermi exclusion re rule. That is, no two particles can have exactly the same quantum numbers. They can't exist in the same state. So bosons don't follow that. Bosons can condense into the same state, the ground state. It's called a supercondensation. And things like that are superfluids and superconductors if it's charged. So they have a very interesting form of matter, and they may form a star. Uh, it's called a Cope Bose Einstein condensate when they collapse into that ground state. Would we be able to see it? Um, possibly. Hmm. Well, the see. only way to see stars, I guess, is uh, electromagnetic the, wave. No, so the way you would see a boson star is because of the um, when two of them collide, we'd get them with a gravitational wave detector. There's a range of uh, neutron stars masses and black hole masses and there's a gap in between that some of these things a boson star could be a possibility in there when a neutron star is impossible and a black hole is impossible then they look for other weird things that could fit in that they have unexplained data so they're hypothesizing yeah. and ron i was gonna say ron Another way to see stars, walk into a wall in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> That'll do her. That's the cartoon way. We'll see that at the beginning yeah. of next week. Yeah. The science card. But I swear, um, let's see, Higgs bosons. Higgs bosons were recently uh, uh, author authorized, if you will, and it's named it's after seven. Guy Higgs, right? There's not a guy named Boson. Yeah, there's Bose. Bose. Yeah, there is. Bose, yeah. I think he's an Indian physicist, yeah. right? Oh, and there's I a guy named Higgs. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, and is that that's not part and parcel of this theory you're just discussing, Jerry? No, bosons definitely exist. There's a Correct. number of bosons that don't exist. Um, oh, it looks like my image is frozen here. I hope I'm not about to lose you guys. <laughs> We're so, still seeing your uh, screen update, though. Uh, okay, the, good. You know, the neutron star. Quark yeah. Star. Yeah. Yeah. Now, every star 
is a balance of forces. And gravity is the crushing force in every case. And when you add more mass, you get more gravity. It crushes things together. And at some point, it you can't have electrons and protons separate. They you the 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 um, gravity crushes them together. The electron and the proton are squished together into something called a neutron. Right. And then when they, when they can't get apart, they're forced together like that. That's a neutron star, and that's its own type of matter, just neutrons. But if if you have more matter than that, you can crush the neutrons together. And you see on the left, neutrons are made up of three quarks, an up, a down, and a strange quark. Uh, so, well, no strange in the neutron. Right. Yeah, yeah that's just, right. There's up and down. Yeah. Yeah. So if you push them close together, even closer, the neutrons lose their identity. And now you just have the quarks, a soup of quarks, whatever it's going to be. And you have all of the quarks up, down, and strange. And they call it a strange quark star because the strange is exhibiting itself now where it didn't before in the neutron star. Now, these are probably of the th four things that we're talking about. This is probably the most likely, in my opinion, to exist. So, strange quarks. Uh -huh. Are they always smaller than a neutron star? Yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. And a neutron star, it seems to me, by definition or description, would have no electromagnetic field. If it's totally neutral, there's no positive or negative out there in space, right? Well, yeah, that's the thing. They're not entirely neutrons. They have stuff on their surface still. Yeah, the electron didn't go away. It got pushed in to the proton. So they cancel that way. But the magnetars that we that are um, thought to exist, and we found several examples, those are neutron stars with intense magnetic fields. And to have a magnetic field, you have to have a charge that is moving, spinning. So somehow there has to be um, an uncanceled charge inside the inside the neutron star. But we don't know exactly what's in the neutron star. Well, it appears that it might have more protons or more electrons if it's not evenly balanced. Possibly. Possibly. Wow. So, um, and then we have the strange matter quark star. And then we have a really weird object called a thorn Zeitkow object. Yep. Of which there is no image, but an artist's impression. And that's basically a star inside a star. <laughs> okay. So it's a neutron star inside a puffy giant star. And this again is purely speculative. Might Betelgeuse be one of those? No, Betelgeuse is certainly a large star. Okay, how do we know what's inside it? Um, it, it exhibits behavior that is accurately modeled by... Um, um, Convection and all kinds of other things. Yeah, what, yeah the, the usual stuff. So in 2014, um, they were they were speculated the um, by Kip Thorne and Anna Zeitkow back in 1977. Um, they were thrown back into the limelight in 2014 after astronomers suggested they'd finally found one in a star called HV 2112. However, in years since, unsurprisingly, that discovery has remained controversial. And Thorne and Anna Zeitkow. Uh, yeah. And now with this um, psychedelic drawing, I first didn't want to put it in, but then I did. It's pretty, the, um, but it doesn't really show anything. They found a star that's 8,000 light years away that matches the, this, the physical behavior of a strange quark star. So XMMU J173203.3-344518. Oh, is at one. least certainly remarkable. <laughs> but is it strange? Wow. So, um, so they're looking at it. They can see it. It emanates light. 
It, it looks yes. like it, they're mainly looking at it in X-rays because XMM is is an X-ray satellite, right? So it, it was looked at last year by uh, astrophysicists at the University of Tübingen in Germany, reassessed the distance between us and the tiny corpse of a dead star spinning away inside the supernova remnant, uh, and they give another shorter but still forgettable name. Um, that may be a remnant of that um, uh, strange quark star. There was also something in the University of Sao Paulo or may have found a quark star, three quarters the mass of the sun. Yes. You wrote. Could 77 fit inside percent the solar mass. But it could fit inside Manhattan. Wow. That's Yeah, that's the quark star, yeah. A quark star. Geez. Well, this could be framed and put on a wall of a modern art museum, what we're looking uh -huh. at. But uh, four of them. And these just don't march to the same drum as other stars that are out there by the jillions and binaries and trinaries. No, most of the matter in the universe, the, the um, baryonic matter, which is the normal matter that we look at, is. Um, um, just regular stars. Wow. <laughs> There's the four points. This one of them is this a four? no? This this is Proxima Centauri. Oh, we're going out to our near neighbor. Yeah, our nearby exoplanet, the closest you, one to us. You know, we found a um, planet in the Goldilocks zone where at least from thermodynamic, from temperature measurements, liquid water would be possible. But this right. is a gigando flare on Proxima Centauri. Which Just is red not, blue. not unlike what the, our sun produces, but it's a much bigger flare, super giant. It is so giant that um, it increased the brightness of uh, Proxima Centauri by over 10,000 times in just a fraction of a second. Now that is such a big flare that um, any life on Proxima Centauri is probably been wiped out or at least create very harsh conditions there. But on, on Proxima Centauri B on the exoplanet, yeah. Oh yeah, Centauri B, yes. A, so Proxima Centauri is the star, Proxima Centauri B is the planet that the planet, um, that kind of stuff, the ultraviolet radiation alone can damage DNA, but also it would blow away, um, these things blow away bits of atmosphere. And with things going on this strong and this um, frequently, there's probably no atmosphere to speak of on Proxima Centauri B. So the prospects of life are quite dim. Uh, if there was water on that planet, liquid water it would have been blown away by now it only has this one it only has this one planet it, there's not a proxima c and d and some uh, gas there seems giant. to be a c i think we found two around proxima yeah okay wow little red dwarfs can really belly up their insides yeah that's because they have convection more than than larger stars but that that Proxima B is way in close, farther in than our Mercury is yes. here. In, yeah. Yes, good memory. Well, no, you just sort of understand these things. Red dwarfs, it'd be a red day every day if you could live on Proxima, right? If the sun would be red. As it, no, but your eye, if you evolved on that planet, your eyes would evolve to see it differently than our eyes would. Uh -huh. Our eyes have evolved to uh, adapt to the sun, our sun that produces in the green part of the visible spectrum. And okay, the visible well, spectrum all taken together, we define as white. So all those stupid uh, YouTube videos that I never open that claim there's lights on the surface of Proxima B, there's cities there, I'm not. <laughs> there may be, but it's just rocks cooling off. Uh, <laughs> now, this is our other neighbor, the other direction toward the sun, isn't it? Are we looking at Venus? Yeah, this yeah. is Venus. Okay, we got time to talk about Venus because we got it covered, boy. Why does it have weird clouds? Well, it started off 
it started off apparently the current theory is that it started off as a twin of the earth in more than just being uh 97 percent the mass of earth and the size of earth they're actually truly twin planets when they started evolving and um the speculation is that they they even had oceans on venus at one time oh this is how it looked back then. But, but the idea is that venus never developed a um well let's put it let me go back one the earth was hit by theia uh, a glancing blow and that defined our rotation speed our day as 24 hours or within a few hours of that it was actually faster at, right after the collision probably 12 or 15 hours a day but um venus also apparently was hit but it it didn't come out so well it um lost basically all of its rotation so the day on venus correct me if i'm wrong on this chuck is actually longer than its year yeah so mm -hmm. um and that does not have the spin is so slow that it does not have the the angular momentum to produce a um dynamo effect inside the planet like the earth does so venus did not develop a magnetic field and as such it was exposed to just what proxima b was exposed to and it um it lost its atmos atmosphere at the time it lost its um water water vapor and the it does have active volcanism and so it's continually spewing out co2 and uh, the surface is quite active in that sense but not uh underneath not in the core where the dynamo would be this is a radar image uh, of the surface of venus and the thing that's shown here bright is a certain kind of fluffy texture and this it's uh it's where the the, the uh, texture particles are shorter than the wavelength of light coming bouncing off of it and here it's longer so it's absorbing so so, so those are like volcanic uh vents there where yes. where lava is coming out and right. we've actually found uh you know evidence recently that that it's currently volcanically active right we talked about that i think one or two times ago yeah yeah well, that, and this this if that was on earth it'd be a caldera a uh, three of them there calderas yeah. the size yeah of those would be big like um like yellowstone wow so it had oceans and they were blown away and it's yeah. all because of no magnetic field was produced you right. got to be moving you got to be turning to make it a magnetic right. field you can't just have a bunch of metal in your core well you can if it if it's rotating it's got to rotate it's got to move you got to have a circular circuit in order to produce a dipole magnetic field is that something edison discovered or tesla that's, that's how we I get our electricity. That was Michael Faraday or oh. James Clerk Maxwell formalized it back in 1860. How a lot of our electricity is is uh, generated, isn't it? Either from water going through a dam or what else curves air hitting a big turning. What do they call them? Turbines, basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you can you can produce a magnetic field by a current loop. But you can also produce current by a magnetic loop, by a moving magnetic loop. And that's the generator. So you have water go over a paddle wheel. It spins a stat stator that has coils in it in a permanent magnetic field, and it generates electricity. Uh, the fight between Faraday, or not Faraday, who are those guys? Tesla, Tesla and Edison. And Tesla, yeah, uh, was between AC and DC right right uh so you that can movement... transmit ac over long distances but you can't do that for dc yeah just outside of provo utah is an example of what edison wanted to build there's a um a fixture there uh, a mm -hmm. small building that he wanted to use as a uh, you know to generate uh, dc you know direct current but, but yeah direct current yeah but the the line losses are just incredible Yes, so um, this represents the atmosphere of Venus. Interest is turning to the atmosphere of Venus. Organic molecules uh, have been found in the atmosphere. Um, Venus has very um, 
dynamic winds. I know this is hard to read, but the winds are rotating. The winds are going around faster than the planet is. Mm. So um, you can get this complicated but simple or not. Anyway, you get this flow of uh, atmosphere and it's being studied and it's going to be studied some more with spacecraft. Uh, we have sent the Soviet Union sent its Venera spacecraft to the surface of Venus back in the 60s, I think it was, or the 70s. Um, 19, eight, 1956 was that one. <clears throat> anyway, so it only lasted about 160 minutes, I think, on the surface before it was dissolved. The pressure is 900 atmospheres here, and it's um, largely an acidic atmosphere. So it corroded the uh, spacecraft away. The uh, new probes will be focused on the atmosphere. And this shows a uh, NASA concept, solar powered NASA logo blimps above the surface. Um, and the article I saw the, on this pointed out that this would be a uh, Lando Calrissian's delight. Yeah. Or it'll be flashing Goodyear on the side. <laughs> or, or Snoopy or something Snoopy like or that. Met life. <laughs> but above, above the CO2, and because the thing had lost its oceans because of no magnetic field, when volcanoes spewed out the CO2, the CO2 couldn't be absorbed by the oceans like it was on the Earth. So the CO2 became dominant in the atmosphere. But above the CO2 dominated atmosphere is an atmosphere that's similar to Earth in density and composition. And that's why they're proposing to put uh, probes up in the atmosphere, in the upper atmosphere. Of course, to dip down into these clouds would be death. That's CO2 cloud. That's not... Uh, yeah, water. And, and acid. And acid, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, some things that I don't understand. You say 900 times the atmospheric pressure, and I, I think I heard 900 degrees, too. Is that possible? Uh, that it's 900 like 864 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. Oh, yeah. yeah, it'll melt lead. Well, how yeah. come? Why Russian is, satellites. Isn't it about the same amount of uh, matter that forms the uh, atmosphere on Venus? Why would it be 900 times bigger? It's a much thicker atmosphere. Yeah, there's 900 times more atmosphere. Titan also does the same thing to us. It's got a very thick atmosphere. Huh. Well, that's what, what is that supposed to go? Do you know, uh, do, do they have a probe set for launch in a year or two? Uh, let's see. The, I think we have some dates on that. I think they, they, they one of the major ones has been delayed just recently. We're also going out to Galilean moons around Jupiter, it looks like here. Yeah, they just launched uh, the European Space Agency mission. Oh, ESA. That wasn't the one at midnight last Friday night from no. Hamburg that gave everybody a shock with a sonic boom at midnight. Uh, fascinating. I, and the, that, uh, yeah, I have no dates for the Venus missions. It's, um, it's obviously not funded. I don't think anyone's building anything now. I, yeah, there were like four of them. One of them was scheduled to launch fairly <laughs> soon, but uh, they had budget problems and they've delayed it. Okay. So All these right. are the Galilean moons that uh, Juice is looking to look at. These are the three icy moons. This one's not icy. That's why there's a space between it and the other one. They just included it to be fair. <laughs> so they, these all have, see the blue layer, these all have some form of ocean under a icy mantle and an icy uh, surface. So they're going to get, these are, and these interiors are made by, are mapped by satellites that we have up there. What is the one? Juno. Um, and they can tell the mass distribution by flying near it and modeling what the gravitational field is. Yeah, that was primarily the Galileo spacecraft. Okay, yeah. The Galileo has has a plaque on it, and my name is on the Galileo plaque. Uh, well, it's now been burned up. <laughs> yep. Easy come, easy go. Yeah. But that information is never lost in the in the universe. So anyway, <laughs> um, Starship was postponed today. It didn't launch. It's now on the, on the dock to launch on Thursday. It is um, the first flight of the full the full shebang. 
but they're not trying any fancy landings that when they separate both of them, each of them separately is going to fall back into the ocean, ker splash, and uh, somewhere near the uh, Hawaiian Islands. Now, this is Elon Musk, this right? This is Elon Tex Musk, yeah. From Texas? Uh, they're going to launch from Texas, yes. Got it. Wow. Back, back booster burn here. So it's going to do, it's going to do all the maneuvers except uh, land on something, something that preserves it. So this is going to land a water landing in the Gulf of Mexico, kabloop and be gone. Uh, Starship is going to do all the maneuvers and fall down here and belly flop into the Pacific Ocean. Hmm. hmm. But now, my, Thursday, my bet is that it'll all end up in a large fireball for the first attempt, but oh well. It, it may stay right here. Yeah. yeah. The it's first stage of anything has never really worked in my memory. And so don't confuse this with Artemis II, which has four astronauts going around the moon in next year, I guess. This is different. Yeah. Wow. Gentlemen, we've run out of time, but it's as fascinating as ever. Real quickly, uh, 29th of this month, which is the last Sunday, Chuck, we're going to be out there all day at Camino Real? So, on the 29th, yeah. It's International yeah. Astronomy Day. Okay. And that's celebrated everywhere or just here in our town? International. International. Yeah. Okay. We're going to watch the sun during the day, but the real problem party is at night, isn't it? Yeah, well, during the day, we'll have solar filter telescopes and we'll have a bunch of activities, astronomy learning activities and giveaways. We got a bunch of students coming up from Caltech to help out with that. And, um, uh, you know, all day at Camino Rail Marketplace, the 29th, Saturday, uh, conflicting with Earth Day, but that's life. Hmm. That's true, but they started, that started here, you know, that's yeah. the same time. Sandy Searle told us uh, she runs a local Las Cumbres Observatory. They're Meeting on the 27th, which is a couple Thursdays from now, I believe, downtown on Lower State Street for one of those astronomy on tap things at a brand new bar called uh, M Special, M dot Special Bar. And that's seven o'clock at night. And it's going to be interesting talking about uh, traveling around vacations in space or something like that. Gentlemen, let's do it again. Number 114 coming at us next week. In the meantime, take care of yourselves and your beautiful wives and Get ready for May the, what is it, second, third, somewhere coming up. Our next general meeting will be in Farron Hall. Okay. Party in May. <clears throat> I'm still here, but you can't see me. I'm waving. All right. <laughs> okay, guys. We'll talk Bye. to you.